All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center. I'm really pleased to welcome you to the latest in our series of uh, webinars on marine protected areas and related topics. Today's subject, we're going to be hearing about indigenous knowledge and use of ocean currents in the Bering Strait region by Julie Raymond Yakubian of Kerouac Incorporated. We're really pleased to have Julie here. I'll introduce her in a moment. And I also want to thank Open Channels and EBM Tools for being the co-sponsors on this webinar series. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the format. Julie is going to give a presentation, and then we're going to have a Q&A. So I encourage you to submit any questions that you have in the question box on the webinar interface. And you don't need to wait till the end to do that. You can do that at any time. And then we'll go ahead and take those at the end of the presentation. So uh, Julie is an anthropologist and the social science program director at Kerouac Incorporated in Nome, Alaska. She has master's degrees in anthropology and northern studies. And her work focuses on collaborating with Bering Strait region tribes on research projects related to subsistence resources and practices. Some of her recent projects have included research on traditional knowledge and use of ocean currents, fish, seals, walruses, and the relationships between human, animals, and the environment, and the importance of subsistence practices to individual and community well-being. So thanks very much, Julie, and I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to start off by saying thank you to Noah and the organizers of this webinar. I'm looking forward to our discussion at the end, and I'm really happy to be here today to share this project with you. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning is give you an overview of Kawarik's in Indigenous Knowledge and Use of Bering Strait Region Ocean Currents Project, um, talk about how we carried it out, who participated, what some of our results were, and uh, why we think this project is important, and then show you some of the products that we've produced, which hopefully will be, um, if not of use to you, of, of interest to you in the work that you do. So there's a little bit of delay with the slides, just so the audience knows that. Um, <clears throat> but first of all, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of, of context for those of you who aren't in Alaska or who don't work in Alaska. This map shows the Bering Strait region where Kawarik, the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium that I work for, is located. The map also shows the 20 federally recognized tribes in this region. And this region is the homeland to three distinct groups of people the Inupiat, Yupik, and Siberian Yupik people. And Kawarik is based out of Nome, um, kind of in the, the center of your screen there. Nome is the hub community for this region, and that's where I'm talking to you from right now. Um, I thought I would just also real briefly give you a, an idea of what our social science program is here at Kawarik. I'm the social science program director, and um, we are within the Natural Resources Division of Kawarik. Kawarik provides a variety of different services to tribes and residents of the Bering Strait region, um, ranging from um, Head Start services in different communities to adult education. And um, our program at, in social science does, as was mentioned, collaborative research with tribes in the region on topics primarily related to subsistence and subsistence resources and how um, those resources are important to communities. We also do a lot of advocacy work. Um, working for policies and management that um, benefit our region residents and that support their subsistence way of life. Um, so that's a quick overview of what the social science program is. Um, this particular project that I'm going to talk to you about this morning uh, was carried out with funding from the National Park Service's Shared Beringian Heritage Program. And the Shared Beringian Heritage Program recognizes and celebrates the natural resources and cultural heritage shared by Russia and the United States on both sides of the Bering Strait. So the program works to improve local, national, international understanding of these resources and to sustain the cultural vitality of Native peoples in the region in both the United States and Russia. And um, there's a link to their website on your screen right now, as well as the Coeric Social Science Program website. <clears throat> so this project was a three-year effort and it included collaboration with Alaskan communities, as well as a partnership with Russian colleagues and communities in Chukotka. And the goals of the project were to document traditional and contemporary knowledge and use of ocean currents, 
to talk about changes to ocean currents over time, to do some documentation of indigenous words related to ocean currents, um, to create a map with spatial information about ocean currents, and to promote exchange and sharing of this information between communities and between communities and Western science researchers, and also between communities and anyone else that this information is useful or interesting to. So this map here um, shows the communities that participated directly in this project. In Alaska, we worked with Diomede, Wales, and Shishmaref. And in Chukotka, our colleague Yuri Kolokov and his staff at the Pacific Scientific Research Fisheries Center worked with four additional communities. And I'm going to be focusing on um, the work that was done in Alaska this morning. So it looks like this slide is not coming up for you quite yet. Um, but for the, the work that we did in Alaska, the Diomede, Wales, and Shishmaref tribal councils identified the ocean currents experts that they wanted us to work with. Um, we approached them with the project. They approved the concept. And um, once funding was received, we worked with them to talk about exactly what kind of information they wanted documented and um, who they wanted us to work with to document that information. And we worked with experts in the community. Um, and experts we defined as people who had lived in their community for all of their life, for the majority of their life, people who have spent a lot of time out in the marine environment, and who their peers and their tribal council considered to be um, subject matter experts on the topic of ocean currents. We also held several community meetings in each village to introduce the project to the community, as well as through the course of the project to update them on how the work was going. We hired local assistants in each community to help us carry out the work. And as I mentioned, we worked with the tribal councils at the beginning, but also through the course of the project to um, determine what information they wanted documented and if the project was heading in the direction they had anticipated. Um, so we interviewed experts in each community. And these were semi-structured interviews that covered topics such as the location and the characteristics of ocean currents, how animals use ocean currents, safety information, um, and a lot of other information as well. <clears throat> we also mapped ocean currents and other features of the marine environment during interviews. And that spatial information from the experts in Alaska was eventually all put on one map, which I will um, show you in a few minutes. And that map is one of our final products. Uh, what you see in these, these images here on the left is John Sinook, an expert on ocean currents from Shishmaref. And this was during the course of um, one of his interviews where we were talking about the location of some important ocean currents. And on the right there are uh, Edward and Robert Sulik from Diomede. And they're reviewing a draft map for the project. So they're looking at a map in draft form that includes all of the spatial information from the three communities. And um, we're revising and making corrections to that map. <coughs> so as part of this project, when we were still in the process of finalizing the ocean currents map and some of the other project data, we held a workshop in Nome. We brought um, participants from each of the Alaska communities to Nome for a day and a half to talk about um, the draft map that we had produced, as well as um, the draft report for this project. And the, we also brought together several Western scientists to the workshop to um, work with us at this point in the, in the project and to exchange information between community members and um, several Western science researchers who work on ocean currents in the Bering Strait. Uh, we wanted the workshop to be a place to exchange information, to talk about future collaborations, as well as to review the draft map and other data. And this workshop was really successful. Um, and it was really fun as well. But the participants included um, several experts from Shishmaref and Wales. Um, Diomede experts were scheduled to attend but couldn't. And 
if you know this part of the world, weather is a big factor in everything we do, and um, that was why they weren't able to attend. Um, but we also had youth participants from Shishmaref and from Wales. We had several National Park Service associated staff, um, other COERIC staff from our organization, um, and a Western scientist from the University of Washington and from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And in addition to the map and data review activities, we also had various activities over the course of the two days for the youth participants. Um, for example, that top image that you're seeing is um, a youth from Wales. And um, one of the things that we did in this project was to document hand signals that boat crews use when they're out on the water, hunting or usually when they're hunting. And um, these signals are used to communicate non-verbally about uh, what people are seeing out in the water. Um, sometimes people use this just to be quiet so they don't have to make noise while they're in the boat. Um, other times it could be to communicate to a boat that's nearby um, but that they can't actually speak to. Um, so he's demonstrating the sign for seal. So if you're in a boat and someone's making that, that signal, that means they see a seal somewhere. And so we had the youth participants um, do all of the signs that we had documented with hunters, and that's a, a little appendix in our final report if you're interested in that. Um, so that was one of the youth activities. We also talked about, as a group, data gaps in ocean currents knowledge from both the traditional knowledge perspective and the Western science perspective. Uh, we talked about convergences and overlaps in knowledge, um, <clears throat> which was all really interesting for our whole group. Um, for example, one of the things we, we discussed was that our local experts from the villages <coughs> excuse me, know a great deal of information about what's happening in the nearshore environment with ocean currents. Um, that's where they spend a huge amount of their time when they're out hunting or doing other activities. But from the Western science perspective, the nearshore environment in terms of ocean currents is much less understood. And um, similarly, the Western scientists who were at our workshop um, are very knowledgeable about the far offshore environment, um, hundreds of miles offshore where most hunters or other community members don't go or rarely, if ever, go. Um, they also have instruments deployed you know, at different levels within the water column. Um, and so they have a body of knowledge about far offshore and down into the water column that um, many of our local experts did not have. And so um, we spend a lot of time talking about how those two bodies of offshore and nearshore, um, how, how those bodies of knowledge met um, in the room and what we could learn from each other, and also talked about potential future projects that we could work on together that would help bridge those gaps on both sides. Um, so a lot of really interesting and valuable discussions about those kinds of topics. And so we saw this workshop as kind of a first step towards bringing together traditional knowledge and Western science on this topic in the Bering Strait region. Um, and the project itself, too, is also kind of a first step. Uh, we only worked with three communities in Alaska, and we have um, 20 tribes that are members of our tribal consortium. And a lot of other tribes are interested in participating in this project and having their knowledge documented in a similar way. So we kind of saw this as a pilot project that uh, we may be able to expand upon in the future. <coughs> um, so that was the workshop. And uh, now I'll share with you some of the results of our project. Um, this table that you're seeing now is a small example of some of the language documentation that we did. In the process of talking about currents, people shared. And we also asked about indigenous terms and phrases related to ocean currents. And language is an extremely important part of traditional knowledge about ocean currents about subsistence activities, and about all other aspects of regional culture. And one concern that was raised repeatedly during the course of this project, as well as other projects that we work on, um, is about language loss <coughs> and youth comprehension, um, in this case of Inupiaq. All three communities that we worked with um, speak Inupiaq. So experts talked about how, when they were growing up, and when they were going out in boats, out on the water, and learning about ocean currents and subsistence, almost everything was communicated to them in Inupiaq. Uh, so this is a, a really big change and a big concern for most residents that that is not how knowledge, in most cases, is being communicated today. Um, so this was not a, a linguistic anthropology project, um, but we did want to try and document 
as many words and phrases as we could um, that related to this topic as we were carrying out this project. So um, this is just an example of some of the words from Shishmaref. Um, none of this is new, obviously, but we thought it was important to connect this work to that concern that experts have and to include some of this linguistic knowledge in the context of the, the final report that we produced. Um, <clears throat> another big theme in this project was how animals use ocean currents, which of course is important because people are out on the ocean. One of the main reasons they're out on the ocean is to look for animals. Um, and this quote on your screen is from a Shishmaraf expert, Morris Kayuteluk, and Morris says, the sea animals, they use currents very well, like walrus and ugruk and even spotted seal, common seal, they know they will be safe because they're heading north anyway. That walrus will stay on the ice for up to one week, just sleep, and they know that predominant current will take them up. Um, so the experts that we worked with had a lot of really detailed knowledge about how different species of animals um, use currents, and that was one of the things that we focused on um, for the project. And there's another there you go, table coming up on your screen. Um, this table summarizes some basic information about how different animals use currents or behave in ocean currents. Um, <clears throat> anything from you know, passive travel, birds landing on the water um, and being drifted by a current, to um, more actively using currents. Um, walrus, for example, going up on the ice and knowing that it's going to, to move them north. Um, and people even describe things like playing behavior by seals and currents, um, especially where the currents come in and out of entrances to lagoons. Um, so different, different animals using the currents in different ways. <clears throat> we also talked about other resources that are influenced by currents and that are important to communities. And these are things such as clams and other seafoods like sea peaches, um, and driftwood, all of which you can see on your screen right now. Um, driftwood was a critical resource for communities in the past. Um, if you haven't ever been to this part of Alaska before, there's very few trees. It's a tundra-type environment. And so driftwood um, that people needed to construct fish drying racks or meat drying racks, like you can see on that top photo, um, for house construction tools, um, heating purposes, all that driftwood was really important to communities in the past. And uh, they have a lot of detailed knowledge about where currents would typically bring driftwood ashore, um, and people would know where to get it. And um, driftwood was also very important for the construction of skin boats, or umiat. And there are specific places on along the mainland shoreline. This image on the top is from Diomede. Um, but there are places along the shoreline um, that their Inupiaq names have to do with building boats or something to do with wood and getting wood. So that was an extremely critical resource for people in the past. Not, not as much today, but still an important resource for some communities. Um, clams, that bottom photo on the left, also an important subsistence resource for some communities. Um, there's been some changes in how clams are accessed by communities, particularly in the Wales area. Um, for example, um, changes in fall storms in their frequency and severity have led to changes in the bottom, um, the configuration of the seafloor near whales, and um, there are these large uh, divots in the bottom of the sea now um, that are collecting clams, whereas in the past, the wind and the currents, when they coincided in, into the right pattern, would push these clams up on shore, and people would just go and collect them at certain times of the year, and they were an important and, and valued resource. But now that there's been this change to the bottom of the ocean in front of whales, um, far fewer clams are now washing up on shore. And that picture on the bottom right there is it's called a, a sea peach, and that's another resource that is uh, washed on shore in different locations that people harvest um, for subsistence. Um, so one, one big change in how people relate to ocean currents and the marine environment in general since more traditional times is the way that uh, people access the ocean and the equipment and vehicles which they use. And our experts talk a lot about differences between traditional skin boats, 
or umiat, and aluminum boats, which almost everyone uses today. And so we listed out some of the advantages and disadvantages of both types of boats. Um, on your screen right now are the advantages and disadvantages of skin boats. And uh, this actually gives you a lot of insight into how people relate to the marine, marine environment and what some changes to that relationship have been. Um, the boat or the you know the vehicle for moving around in that environment is really crucial, obviously. So if you just pick one or two of these factors here, uh, for example, skin boats are quieter when approaching animals. Um, that's an advantage, but a disadvantage is that they require a lot of labor to produce the skins and to maintain, um, as opposed to this next slide that is popping up about the advantages and disadvantages of aluminum boats. Um, is it showing up yet? It's, it's loading. Oh, there it goes. It's loading. Um, so that actually gives you gives you some insight into the kind of decision making that people are making. What's most important to them? Yes, they may be quiet when approaching animals, which is important, but um, you know they have this these other disadvantages that go along with them as well. Um, and then aluminum boats have advantages and disadvantages as well. They're much more maneuverable. Um, but they become leaky over time as parts come loose, as screws and bolts come loose. So um, you can see the kinds of things that people are having to weigh when they decide what kind of equipment they're going to use. Um, aluminum boats, like I said, are used by almost everyone um, at this point in time, but even so, people talk about how skin boats are better. There, You can see that quote there from um, Patrick Omiak that nothing beats skin boats. Um, that they do have a lot of advantages, but a lot of disadvantages or difficulties in maintaining and using them as well. Um, let's see. Um, so that was a couple tables. Um, I'll show you some more images while I talk about other aspects of our work. Um, the image that's loading on your screen now is of the south side of Little Diomede Island. Another major topic of discussion with the experts in this project was how ice, wind, and currents interact with each other. And as one diamede expert said, the currents operate the ice. So for example, in the image above, the currents are pushing the ice against the south side of Little Diomede as the currents are moving and pushing ice northwards. <coughs> the currents are pushing and piling the ice, which impacts a lot of things, including how hunting and other activities like ice fishing and, and crabbing can take place um, by community members in Diomede. And the actual community of Diomede is just to the left of this photo um, on a similar environment, very steep environment. Um, and the sea ice that forms around and in front of the village um, is a really important platform for a variety of other activities. Um, maybe just to say a little bit more about that uh, climate change is obviously impacting Arctic sea ice in many ways. And one of the ways is that ice is forming later and forming thinner. And because the ice is thinner, um, or because the ice is taking longer to get thick, um, the currents are able to kind of uh, bully the ice around and push it up on top of itself, crumble it up, et cetera. Um, so for diamede, again, for example, the ice used to freeze up in a much flatter, more uniform way in front of the village. Um, but the thinner ice that's forming today, um, when it isn't getting piled up on top of itself, as you can see it's starting to do in this image, um, it can break off from the island easier, meaning that it may have to reform many times before it finally freezes over into a platform that's usable um, for community members. And um, like I said, this has impacts on subsistence activities like like hunting, people need to pull their boats to certain areas before they launch them. Um, having the right ice to do ice fishing or crabbing activities, but has also been a really big impact on the community's ability to have um, an ice runway, for example. During the winter months when the ice freezes flat enough and thick enough, um, they actually create a runway for small planes to land on, and that's how they get many of their supplies and people move on and off the island. But for the past um, I believe three years now, they haven't been able to do that because of ice and weather conditions. So um, big changes that are happening all around our region. Um, 
this image that's loading on your screen now um, is an actual ocean current. Ocean currents can be kind of difficult to, to photograph, especially from land. But <coughs> this image here is um, standing on Little Diomede looking across to Big Diomede in Russia. So the international dateline is in there. Um, so I mentioned the idea of change and the idea that change is one of the things that, that experts talked a lot about. Um, and as it turns out, um, ocean currents are seen as one of the more stable features of the environment by the experts that we spoke with. Experts did not have a lot of examples of currents changing over their lifetimes, but they could talk in detail about many of the other changes um, for the climate to equipment, for example, to culture, to their communities. As one Shishmarath expert explained, the current is always there, and it always will be there. So while knowledge about the location and characteristics of ocean currents is considered to be crucial for boat captains, other factors like wind and ice are viewed as playing a larger role in determining whether or not to go out in a boat or how to operate when you're already out there. And this is because these other factors are much less predictable and much more changeable than ocean currents are. So ice, wind, and currents and all the ways that these factors interact is really important. And hunters and other community members traditionally learned from a young age how to read signs in the environment that would help them predict and understand weather conditions um, on land and on the marine environment as well. Um, so it's not as common today to be a real expert weatherman. Um, some boat captor, captains and hunters um, are expert weathermen um, in the traditional sense of the term um, and are able to read conditions out in the environment um, very, very clearly. Um, but people also rely on a lot of other sources today, such as radio, TV, and internet to get weather reports and to take that into consideration with what they're observing out in their environment and also communicate and discuss um, ongoing weather patterns with other community members, too. Um, so an important aspect um, of the landscape in this part of the world is um, features that can help you interpret weather conditions, like tall peaks. And these peaks are also important for navigation out on the open water, where there are very few features to help people figure out where they are or where they're going. And this image here is um, of Ear Mountain behind Shishmaraf. So the water you're seeing is actually a lagoon, not the ocean. The ocean is behind you as the viewer. Um, and Ear Mountain is a very important landscape feature for reading the weather as well as for navigating while out on the ocean. Um, hunters from Shishmaraf know exactly what that mountain looks like from different distances offshore. I mean, how tall it will be in their horizon. So um, it's an important way for them, along with their GPS units, of course, which they do use to figure out uh, where they are, um, where the currents are taking them, and how fast, um, and other other factors that they calculate when they're out in the marine environment. Um, so we documented several more of these land-based places during the course of the project, too. And, and these are actually included on our ocean currents map because they're um, such important features for boaters out on the water. Um, just a few more points that I wanted to say here. Um, one of the things that prompted COERC to pursue funding for this project was um, some stories that I heard from hunters about some of their hunting strategies while working on other projects and um, stories that we have in our archives here at COERC that I had read. Um, things that kind of just, they really blew me away in, in how sophisticated and um, important they were. Um, so in, in order to be successful, for example, hunters must understand human behavior, animal behavior and how that relates to weather patterns and the currents, including ice movements, all of the things I was just briefly talking about. And um, experienced hunters will use the ocean current to their advantage when out hunting. So for example, hunters from Diomede and from Wales um, typically prefer to go south when they hunt, to go against the current. And while they're doing that, they're looking for walruses um, south of them because they know that the current will move them back north, uh, back towards their communities. And if they hunt to the north, the currents will constantly be taking them further from their villages. So if you can just, I don't have the map up there, but if you can just kind of picture that, traveling south from Wales to look for walrus on the ice, uh, finding walrus, successfully 
getting some of them, um, having to pull your boat up onto the ice, butcher the animals on the ice. The whole time while you're doing this, the current is moving you back north, back towards the village of Wales. And so um, lots of stories from hunters about you know, how they had this strategy in mind, and as soon as they finished um, putting the animal back in the boat, um, there's whales you know, just a few miles away offshore, um, and they're able to just get off the ice and go right back home. So really, really technical strategies that people are using, and that, which require a, a huge body of knowledge to be able to carry out successfully. Um, one of the things that, that prompted us to do this project so we could document some of that in more detail. Um, so knowledge of ocean currents as well as the entire marine ecosystem of which they're a part is crucial, as I said, for boat captains to be successful in hunting. But it's also crucial for them to operate safely and effectively in the ocean. Uh, the experts we talked to gained their knowledge of ocean currents over lifetimes of experience and from instruction by elders. And young people today are still expected to learn about ocean currents, primarily by watching what's happening around them, uh, by listening to their elders, and through direct experience. And when taken out boating, or when on shore as older men planned trips, um, young boys and young men, and sometimes girls and women, would, would watch what older men on the boat were doing and listen to what they were saying. And um, young people are encouraged to be very observant. Um, elders would also bring to their specific attention some aspects of the ocean current system, such as a particularly dangerous eddy or other feature when they were approaching it um, while out on the water. And I think uh, this quote here from Gilbert in Wales just summarizes a lot of this really well. That this is a way of life. And that learning these things when you're young is going to feed you and your family for the rest of your life. And kind of to continue with that same line of thought, um, that traditional knowledge is so important in so many ways um, that it's a very serious matter to get out in a boat and to go out into the ocean. I really like this quote that's on your screen now from Luther, also from Wales. Uh, he says, and then first of all, we try to look for where we think the game is. We estimate how long it will take to get from where we see it, then get ready, and how long we think it will drift. Head to that spot. And then at the same time you're doing that, you as a captain have to try and calculate how much gas to carry to reach that area and come back. Of course, you're going to be fighting against the current. You have to figure that part out. It's a serious calculation. You have to be serious about it. And then you have to communicate with other captains that are going out there, too. Communication is very important. So I think that kind of touches on a lot of important things, including the responsibilities of a boat captain. And Luther points that out really nicely, as well as Gilbert in the previous quote, and many of our other experts did as well, that all of this is very serious, which is why um, this project and others like it are, are really important to communities. Um, so that that's, was a really brief description of some of our results, and wanted to encourage you all to visit our website um, to get the full report, um, to look at more details if you're interested. Um, this is the ocean currents in the Bering Strait region of Alaska map that is one of the products of our research. Um, it's included in the final report, as well as a, a short book that we produced based on this project. And uh, each feature on this map is correlated to a number in a guide that, that goes along with the map. Um, we also produced a book and a poster um, that are they're aimed at, at younger people, but are for a general audience. Um, on the left there is the book, and on the right is the poster, and, and both are accessible through our website. Um, so one final thing I wanted to, to mention is, or to talk about is how, how can all this knowledge and research be used, and how is it being used? Um, one of the main ways it's being used right now is in community cultural heritage preservation. A lot of the experts we worked with talked about being really proud of participating in this in this project, in this documentation work. Uh, bilingual and bicultural teachers in the region are using it as part of their curriculum. And um, the experts who participated and others are actively sharing this information with other community members through the ways they always have, but also through some of these products um, which we produce to help facilitate that process. Um, we think that we also contributed to the body of knowledge about ocean currents in the marine environment in this particular part of the world. 
Um, some communities have talked about, fortunately it hasn't had to be used since we implemented this project, but talk about it being helpful for search and rescue operations um, and educating young people about um, when someone does go missing in a boat, um, how they figure out exactly where to go look for them, um, which they're very successful at doing in most cases. Um, we've also been trying to use this information in the vessel traffic routing planning that's going on in the Bering Strait region, um, communicating this information to the Coast Guard and, and others who are involved in that planning process, and also sharing this information with the state of Alaska and um, associated entities that are um, doing oil spill response planning in the region related to both shipping traffic and um, just general spill response for the region. And um, just have a couple quick slides to show you from another project being carried out by the National Park Service um, that's using information from this project. Um, they have a project on marine debris, marine debris cleanup and um, this, this slide shows area, areas where erosion is occurring to different degrees. So on the, the bottom left there would be on the community of Wales and the Bering Strait, and up by that big lagoon would be the community of Shishmaref. This is a slide showing areas of high deposition, and then they have superimposed our ocean currents map over that um, because one of, the, one of the things we included on that map was areas where trash, wood, and other things tend to accumulate. So. Um, they're using the alignment of these different models to figure out where they should focus their efforts on uh, with their marine debris cleanup program, um, which is pretty cool. So with that, um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of our project staff and participants. Um, many people you can see on the screen there um, in Alaska and also in Russia. I didn't have a chance to talk about the Russian work, but it is included in our final report. Um, and thank you again to our funder, the National Park Service's Shared Beringi and Heritage Program, and Coerx Natural Resources Division and Wellness Program. And with that, um, Koyana, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. That was really fascinating, and I'm sure that people will have a lot of questions. So I would just encourage people to go ahead and submit any questions they have through the question box on the webinar interface, and there are already a few questions coming in, so I will uh, start with one from Heidi McCann who asks, um, who or what agency will be managing this data going forward? Yes, um, Coeric manages all the data from the projects that we carry out. We have, um, part of our organization is called the Eskimo Heritage Program, and they're an archive based here in Nome that um, stores and archives all of our digital data, I mean, digital audio recordings, video recordings, transcripts, products that we produce, um, and all that information is accessible to the public through our archive. Um, you can reach them through the website you see on the screen there, just the coeric.org part. And um, yeah, so they, they manage it, and um, I can also be contacted if people are interested in the, the data itself. Okay, and there's a question from James Overland who asks, could you talk about some of the current features on your map? Maybe sure. just discuss them a little more. Yeah, let me go back up to that slide. Sure, so um, most of the arrows you're seeing are actual ocean currents, and the map guide that goes along with this gives you some more detail about um, things like the speed at which they operate. Um, some of them are seasonal currents. For example, that one in the bottom left that's kind of going up at an angle towards the land, that's a seasonal current that's only there in the spring. Excuse me, there are some other features. Um, on the land, you can see some green dots, and those are some of the taller mountains, landscape features that I was talking about that are used to navigate. Um, some of these features that you're seeing are um, eddies that form. Um, the little inset there that shows the diomedes, the Diomede Islands, there's two yellow circles with arrows, and um, that's actually one eddy that shows up in different places at different times, but um, a strong eddy that hunters avoid when they do go, go north of the community, they avoid that area. Um, and this, this map is also available large scale, like poster size, so it's much, much easier to read, but um, 
if you look over by the community of Wales at the tip of the Seward Peninsula there, um, you can see a hashed, blue hashed line, which is actually um, a shoal um, and a purple polygon over that. And that's an area where um, ice builds up um, during the course of the winter. So features like that are included. Um, if you move more to the, the west, um, to the north part of the Seward Peninsula there, near Kotzebue Sound, um, that large purple circle to the furthest right on the, the map is an area of open water um, that used to freeze but no longer does. And um, so people used to be able to take their, their snow machines across from um, the southern part of Kotzebue Sound to across to the north part, um, but now this area is often not frozen or not frozen solidly enough to travel on, so that's um, a feature that was included there. And then around where you can see that yellow kind of comma-shaped polygon, um, in that area is an area of very strong currents where ice tends to build up and move around in a slow eddy, and also where walrus can be found um, late in the season because they get they come in on this ice that just kind of sits in that area where currents come together and, and goes around in circles. So it's, that's an area where hunters know to go if they're having a hard time finding walrus late in the season. They'll go there and look for them. But it's a very dangerous area to be with a boat um, when there's ice around. So um, yeah, that's some of the things that, that show up on the map. Great. And this is actually related to what you just discussed, but sure. there's a question from Jib Ravadat asking, what is the trend of retreating sea ice in the area? And I would just ask if you, if people, your experts have commented on the implications or how it's affecting their lives. You talked a little bit about safety and, and hunting circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned some diamide circumstances in particular, but um, sea ice, is a huge part of people's lives in this part of the world. And um, there's a, a lot of actually really excellent resources out there that talk about traditional knowledge of sea ice, if people are interested. Um, and I'm having a brain blank right now, but there are lots of them. And if you're interested and aren't familiar with them, feel free to email me and I can, I can share them with you. But um, in general, um, sea ice is you know, retreating faster. Um, and forming later than it has been in the past. Um, like I said, it's oftentimes it's forming thinner and taking longer to get thicker, um, which changes the way ice moves around in the environment. Um, it breaks off from the land easier, so it takes longer for this platform of, of land shore, land fast sea ice to form, which impacts um, when people can and can't go hunting. Um, around St. Lawrence Island, which was not on this map or part of this project, um, the way that sea ice forms and where it goes during the year has changed drastically. Um, and people are having situations where they, the sea ice is in places it hasn't been before or in, in formations that it hasn't been before. And people aren't able to get out of their community to go hunting. Um, and then up in the Shishmaref area, for example, um, there'll be open water much closer to shore than in the past. Um, there's kind of a tic-tac looking purple area um, on the middle of the map there. And that's an area where um, sea ice tends to congregate and um, get stuck on the, the bottom of the ocean. And so, for example, in some years, so much sea ice will, will build up behind this area that Shishmaref hunters will have a hard time getting around it to go south to look for walrus. And walrus will be passing by um, in different configurations than has been typical in the past, and hunters are missing those animals. So there's, it, each community is experiencing something a little bit different, um, but all of them are being impacted by it for sure, and impacting their subsistence activities to, to greater or lesser degrees. So it's, it's a really important um, change that's happening in the environment right now. And, um, that was a part of this project, and like I said, there's a lot of other really great resources I could help direct people to if they're interested. Well, here's another question about sea ice. Um, is that from Zachary Julia, who asks, with decreased Arctic ice cover, can you talk about how captains have been adjusting to increase vessel traffic in the area? And um, 
are there plans for retaining hunting grounds and maintaining safety in the future as there is more vessel use of this area? Sure. Um, the communities that are seeing the most increase in vessel traffic right now are, as you would probably expect, Diomede and Wales, right there at the narrowest part of the strait. Um, there has been a, a very large, from their perspective, increase in the amount of vessel traffic. And if you've been following this issue, you know it's predicted to get, um, there's predicted to be even more traffic into the future. And uh, there have been no incidents, no scary incidents as of yet that I have heard about of, you know, large boats and small aluminum boats with hunters having, you know, close calls or interactions of, it, of that kind. Um, but the main concern that's coming from communities throughout this region is where are the boats going to go and where are they going to be allowed to go, these large vessels, and um, what happens if there's an accident of some sort. And the Coast Guard right now is in the process of <coughs> collecting public comments for their port access routing study, which is basically going to be the highway they set up um, through this part of the world that large vessels will be um, not required, but suggested that they travel through. And as part of that process, communities are discussing um, a variety of different concerns that they have about how small boats and large boats will interact as the traffic increases, um, how communities can monitor what's going on through um, for example, automatic identification system, AIS um, programs. Um, if there were to be an accident or oil spill of some sort, you know, what exactly will happen? Who is the chain of command? Um, what role will communities play? They're, they consider themselves to be on the front line. Um, if something does go wrong, they're probably going to be first responders to something um, and making sure that they have at least some resources in place to be able to deal with something that might happen. Um, so we're actually Coeric and our, our tribal communities in this region are in the process of coming up with formal comments and recommendations on the Coast Guard's PARS process, but also doing a lot of other work um, on their own um, in their own communities to prepare for what they have seen and, and what they expect to see in the future. Um, it's a really complicated process, and there's a lot of different opinions um, around the Arctic about how much traffic will increase and, and what the impacts of that will be and where it's going to go. Um, we know there's a lot of traffic coming through on the Russian side of the Bering Strait that we don't necessarily know about. Um, there was a Russian fishing vessel that just sank um, in Russian waters, but in the Bering Strait region recently, and uh, how to communicate about those kinds of things and how they're happening. and what their potential impacts to subsistence may be is something that we're all still trying to figure out, I guess I would say. Well, you mentioned Russia, and there was a question from Rudy Reltsberger who asks, um, he'd be curious to learn if there were important differences in findings between, between Alaska and Russia or findings in the study regions are similar. Mm -hmm. I, I would say they're very similar. Um, this project, um, as I mentioned, the Park Service Shared Beringian Heritage Program funded it, and um, their support, the Park Service's support, was really important for this project. Um, I speak very little Russian, and my Russian colleague speaks very little English, <laughs> so we were um, communicating through a variety of different means um, throughout the course of the project, and we definitely were finding similar things in all of the communities that participated, and um, I, w I wouldn't say that there was anything major that, that differed between the two sides of the straits. A lot of the same concerns about um, language loss, about um, climate changes, um, youth participation in you know, learning that knowledge and, and practicing it, um, a lot of really similar things, and I, again, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go into any of that, but there is a full, in English, um, detailed report on the Russian work that can be found on our website as well for people who are interested in that. Okay. Hallie Sachs has a question about the proposed expansion or your desire to expand this program and work with other tribes and wondering if you would make changes to the research or do anything differently. Um, well, I would do a couple things differently, um, primarily because of the funding. Um, Park Service was ge very generous with their funding, but compared to some of our other projects, it, we had 
very little money <laughs> for this project. Um, and we did a lot with it. But we'd like to do a, a lot more community activities where um, you know, we hold workshops, multiple workshops in multiple communities with more Western scientists and more community members to talk about these things. Um, we would like to bring um, Rus Russian participants over to Alaska and vice versa so that there can be a better exchange of knowledge in that direction as well. Um, but as for the, the methods we used, the, the interviews and the community meetings and the workshop, those were all really successful and follow a format that Coeric uses for all of our social science projects. So um, I think expanding the project and expanding the amount of money available um, so that we could grow the activities that we were doing would be um, the main thing. And has there been interest from the communities for future collaborative projects that blend traditional knowledge and contemporary science? And, and if so, what kinds of projects are the communities interested in? Yeah, um, absolutely. There's been discussions about, um, you know, we only, we were only able to bring two Western scientists to our, um, our traditional knowledge workshop, but um, they came up with, the group came up with um, quite a few ideas for how they could work together specifically on ocean currents research. But in general, um, collaborating with community members is something that um, our tribes are always asking for. Um, you know, oftentimes, and I'm not picking on Western scientists at all here, but oftentimes um, communities aren't really included or just in a very kind of superficial way in research that's going on. Um, or for example, people who do research out on vessels out in the ocean, for example, might think, ah, you know, we're out in the water, we're not really doing community work, but um, oftentimes there are community members who are very interested in that kind of work and um, might want to come out on the vessel as part of the research team, for example. And um, we have some people from our region doing work like that right now, um, or planning to do work like that this summer coming up. So I would say a lot of times people assume communities might not be interested in what they're doing if it's not land-based or directly in their community. but um, there is a lot of interest about what's happening out in the ocean, what's happening um, in places where people visit a lot, as well as places where people don't get to so much. You know, these far offshore areas I talked about where hunters rarely go, um, they still have an interest in what's happening out there. And that's because people really see, um, you know, the entire northern Bering Sea and, and Chukchi Sea as connected as one system. And people know that what happens down by St. Lawrence Island is going to impact um, people in Shishmaraf and vice versa. So um, there's a really big interest in all Western science projects that are going on and, and social science projects that, that people might be proposing. Um, just finding the right people in the community who, who are willing to work with you. So Julie, while we go to the next couple of questions, I was going to ask if you could go back to your contact slide just so people can look at that again. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so the other question that uh, came in from Stephen Inslee is, um, you, you talked about the fact that currents are viewed as fairly stable compared to other changes in the environment. But uh, the question was, have locals made observations of changes to currents in recent years? Yeah, there have been some changes. Um, for example, some currents have changed in their speed, for example. They're either not as fast. Um, as they were in the past, or they're um, faster than they have been in the past, and um, other change, <coughs> other changes, and these primarily relate to nearshore currents. Um, I mentioned what was going on with the clams, um, that storms, as well as currents, st storms in conjunction with currents had um, kind of changed the way the seafloor is, is organized in some areas, and that is also having impacts on some of these nearshore currents and how they operate. Um, none of these changes, from my understanding, from our experts, are anything that have caused real concern with anybody. It's not like, you know, the main current going through the Bering Strait has suddenly, you know, veered off to the west or something like that. It's uh, these main currents are operating very similar to the way they have over the course of our experts' lifetimes and our experts. I guess I didn't say ranged in age from um, their mid 40s to their late 70s. Um, so over the course of their lifetimes, 
what they've seen in, in the currents has been very small changes. And again, they, they are more concerned about the climate changes they're experiencing and how the currents are interacting with those changes um, because those it starts you know obviously starts to multiply the more factors you take into consideration here so um, a current moving a little bit slower a little bit faster than it had before might not be a big concern but then when it involves the formation of sea ice in early winter um, that can really change what's happening in a particular location so um, yeah like I said nothing major like a like a big current totally disappearing or a new one appearing um, more small changes in speed, I would say, and a couple changes in um, seasonality. Like there are some seasonal currents that are only there at certain times of the year, and the exact timing of those currents um, may have changed a little bit over their lifetime. OK. Um, there's a question from Niolani Puniwai, who wants to know, is there a plan to integrate this ocean knowledge in ocean models collected from other sources? Yeah, um, that is something that we discussed at our traditional knowledge and Western science workshop um, is how, if and how this information could be incorporated into larger scale work that's happening on ocean currents. And um, we haven't made any movements forward on that yet, but um, the scientists we've worked with as well as others have shown a, a great deal of interest in like I said, this was kind of a pilot project. I mean, we collected a massive amount of information, um, but we also didn't collect it with the intent of inserting it into a model. So I guess maybe this goes back to a question a few minutes ago, what would you do different? If, if our goal was to do that, um, we would have done the project a little bit differently, like probably including oceanographers in the actual um, work with experts to make sure we were getting information that would be useful to a particular model or something. But um, while it probably isn't the kind of information that could go into most models that the scientists we know are working with, um, it certainly could be in the future expanded upon um, and is being used, like I said, to talk about other, other work that could be done, like the best place to deploy um, certain equipment in the strait to get knowledge that people are interested in um, from the Western science and traditional knowledge side. So there's there's conversations about that going on, but not specifically of the modeling kind right now. And Nolani had another question about scale and was wondering if the maps were created at different scales or if there was a standard understanding of the, of the scale at which people operated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, a standard scale was used um, for all the maps during the interviews, and I did not make the digital map that you can see. Our one of our GIS staff did, and um, everything on there should be to scale. Though there's a disclaimer on it that says, obviously, like please don't use this for navigation, mm -hmm. um, and to and another one about consulting your elders before you go out in a boat. Um, you know, don't expect that this is going to get you where you need to go. Um, so yes, we tried to keep everything at the same scale, um, both from the, the interview maps to the final product. But it's again, it's not something that we're recommending be used for navigation, um, more just for understanding the context of all these different marine features and how they're interacting with each other. OK, and then we just have one last question from Andrea Derry, who asks, and you've talked about this a little bit, but I thought it was a nice way to, to wrap things up. What motivates local people to share their knowledge? I think there's quite a few different motivations, which of course may vary between between individuals. But um, you know, the Bering Strait region is going through a lot of changes right now and has been um, climate changes as well as social and economic changes. Um, things like shipping, offshore oil and gas development. There's a, a lot happening, a lot going on. And people are concerned about how, about what the future impacts of all of these things may be on their communities. And so there's always been an interest. This is not a new thing. There's always been an interest in sharing information um, with people like myself, who are, are researchers, um, as well as continuing that 
passing on of knowledge from generation to generation within their communities. So people are, are wanting to see things documented in a way that um, makes them comfortable, that it, it can be preserved for future generations. Um, not preserved as in not changing, but preserved so that it can continue to be used and added to by future generations. So it's, it's a, there's internal motivations, you know, within a community to make sure that your grandson is safe and successful when he goes out hunting or that um, your granddaughter is safe and successful in those activities. There's a concern that, um, you know, regionally and, and as communities that this information stays alive and stays active and stays used. And there's a concern that people want those who are coming in from outside of the region, you know, developers, shippers, other people, to understand who they are and to understand their culture and to understand their way of life and why it's so important to them and why we need to um, protect it. So I think there's a lot of different motivations for sharing this kind of information. Um, and each person may have their own individual combination of those reasons, but it goes, you know, from the individual all the way up to we want the world to, to know more about us and who we are and, and how we live our lives. Great. Well, Julie, thank you so much. Um, I think this has just been really fascinating, and I, I know the, there were a lot of great questions. So I want to thank all the um, participants and also want to thank EBM Tools Network and Open Channels. Um, thanks, you all, for participating. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.